Chapter 19 On one occasion a friar preacher, either to try her, or under some wrong impression, as often happens, maintained that he was better prepared for the divine love than herself, alleging as a reason that on entering religion he had renounced everything external and internal, and therefore he was more free and better prepared to love God than herself and for many other reasons, such as men can adduce, who are more learned than holy and devout, but especially because she was wedded to the world and himself to religion. When the friar had said many things of this kind, an ardent flame of pure love seized the blessed Catherine, with which her heart was so inflamed that she rose to her feet and fervently exclaimed, If I believed that your habit would add one spark to my love, I would not hesitate to tear it from you, if I could obtain it in no other way. Whatever you merit more than I, through the renunciation you have made for God's sake, and through your religious life, which continually enables you to merit, I do not seek to obtain it. These are yours. But that I cannot love God as much as yourself, you can never make me believe. She uttered these words with so much fervor and effect, that her hair burst from the band that confined it, and fell disheveled over her shoulders, so that, in her burning zeal, she seemed almost beside herself, and yet so graceful and decorous was her bearing, that all persons present were amazed, edified, and pleased, and she added, Love cannot be checked, and if checked, it is not pure and simple love. When she reached the house, she said, after the manner in which she was accustomed to speak familiarly with her lord. O oh, love, who shall prevent me from loving thee, not only in the world as I am, meaning the married state, but even if I should find myself in a camp of soldiers, I could not be prevented from loving thee. If the world, or if the husband could impede love, what would such love be, but a thing of feeble virtue and mean capacity? As for me, I know by what I have experienced, that divine love can be conquered or impeded by nothing, it conquers all. Catherine did not intend to say that the path to perfect love was as easy to seculars as to religious, but what she said applied only to perfect and pure love, because such a love breaks through all restraints and conquers all difficulties. On being told that she might be deceived by the devil, she replied, I cannot believe that a love which has nothing of self in it can ever be deceived. And God communicated to her interiorly that she was in the right, saying to her, that if it were possible for one to love even the devil with pure love, free from everything pertaining to self, malignant and odious as he is, he could not harm this soul, for pure love has such virtue that it would deprive him of his malignity. If, then, pure love has such power over one so wicked, who can doubt a soul who possesses it? For if pure and simple love in any creature could be deceived, God cannot be. Catherine being on one occasion greatly troubled and oppressed by her humanity, because she had consented, in order to sustain a feeble and infirm life, to use things lawful and permitted, God thus instructed her concerning these things. I never wished you to turn your eyes towards anything but love, and there rest, unmoved by any novelty that may present itself, within and without, but like one dead to all things. Because he who trusts in me must never doubt himself. For all the reasoning, cogitations, alternations, and doubts, which man has concerning the spirit, proceed from that very evil root of self, for pure love transcends all human thoughts, and will not live in the soul, still less in the body of man, according to their nature, but will do all things above the capacity of that nature, and all that it thinks and speaks is always above nature. Chapter 20 This holy soul being, as may be inferred from what has already been said, arrived at that state of perfection where she began to taste the fruition of eternal happiness, and regarding those who are still deceived by the passions of the present time, and know not how to hasten from that which is so wholly evil, was moved by compassion, and she said, O oh man, created in such great dignity, why dost thou lose thyself in things so vile? If thou shouldest consider well, 
thou shouldest easily see that all worldly things which thou desirest are as nothing when compared to those spiritual goods which god gives thee even in this life which is so full of ignorance pray that thou mayest come hereafter to that celestial country in which are things which eye hath not seen nor ear heard neither hath it entered into the heart of man to conceive what god hath prepared for them that love him if man clearly saw that by well-doing he could gain eternal life and could imagine how great the happiness of heaven will be he will always persevere in good and even should he live until the end of the world he would never occupy his memory intellect or will on any but celestial things but god wishes that faith should be meritorious and not that man should serve him through self-interest and therefore he conducts him by degrees although he always gives him sufficient knowledge to support his faith but afterwards he gives him such an aftertaste of eternal glory that by a clear and certain perception which he receives at the close of this life the faith of man thus replenished with heavenly delights almost ceases to be faith on the other hand if man could know how greatly he must suffer hereafter for his sins hold it for certain that for very fear he would not only abandon all things but that he would not commit the smallest sin but god does not wish to be served through fear because if man's heart were filled with terror love could find no entrance there it is through love that god does not permit man to behold this dreadful sight although he does in part discover it to those who are so protected and occupied with that pure love which casteth out fear that the doors cannot be shut against them these souls see in heaven and earth things which tongue cannot express and they are drawn by sweet allurements and gentle ways this is what happens to those who allow themselves to be led by faith and who recognizing the benignant hand of god in all that befalls them never reject it but rather cleave to it strongly and follow it with joy but those who refuse so much goodness and deliberately persevere in living according to his own desires will have at the moment of their death a vision so painful and so terrible that having in themselves even one defect they will be unable to endure the sight and therefore amazed at such stupidity the saint exclaimed o oh, miserable man who will not provide against a fate so unhappy and caused only by thine own obstinacy thou thinkest not of it yet know that it will befall thee when it is too late in heaven nothing can enter which is defiled and purgatory must cleanse thee before thou canst attain eternal felicity god she said leads man by a road intermediate between these two he shows him always great tokens of his love in order to attract man who is naturally more inclined to act through love than fear yet he gives him also the motive of fear that by it he may more readily abandon his sins but neither the love nor the fear which god grants him are so great to force man towards him because it is his will that grace should be accomplished by free will and faith by which man does all that is within his power the rest god effects by his good inspirations which when once man has yielded his consent easily incite him to combat his rebellious nature and by the help of the great satisfaction which god imparts to hold it at its true value and therefore she said when i see that god is ever ready to give us all the interior and exterior aids necessary for our salvation and that he observes our deeds solely for our own good when on the other hand i see man continually occupied in useless things contrary to himself and of no value and that at the hour of death god will say to him what is there o man that i could have done for thee which i have not done and that man will clearly know this to be true i believe that he will have to render a stricter account for this than for all other sins and i am amazed and cannot understand how man can be so mad as to neglect a thing of such vast and extreme importance the vision which she had of all this was not represented to her mind in a manner so weak as that in which it is here recounted but so clearly that it seemed to her that she could see and touch it 
and doubtless he who should behold such a sight would rather choose death itself than offend god voluntarily even in the least degree this however did not cause her such wonder when she considered the great evils from which men are freed and the eternal joys to which they are destined and sweetly guided therefore she held herself in great aversion and did not hesitate to say in this life i desire neither grace nor mercy but only justice and vengeance upon the evil-doer she said this with much earnestness because she saw that the mercy and goodness of god toward his elect infinitely surpassed their gratitude toward him and their sorrow for their sins and therefore she could not endure that her own offences against her love should go unpunished this appeared to be the reason why she cared little about gaining plenary indulgences not that she did not hold them in great reverence and devotion or esteem them of great value but that for her own part she would rather be chastised and receive the just punishment assigned her than by this satisfaction be released in the sight of god the offended seemed to her to be of such goodness and the offender so much opposed to him in all things that she could not endure to see anything which was not subjected to the divine justice that so it might be well chastised and therefore to abandon all hope of escaping this righteous pain she did not seek for plenary indulgences nor even recommend herself to the prayers of others in order that she might be ever subject and be punished and condemned as she had deserved what has just been said can be comprehended in the state of perfection to which the saint had been raised and in which being as it were secure of victory she desired to combat purely for the greater glory of her lord and like a valiant soldier never sought for nor desired any assistance and being unable to support the sight of an offence against god she said to him my love i can endure all things else but to have offended thee is a thing so dreadful and unbearable to me that i pray thee to let me suffer anything else than to see that i have done so the insults that i have offered thee i am sorry to have offered nor can i ever consent to offend thee more at the hour of death show me rather all the demons with all their plans for i would think it nothing in comparison with the sight of one offence against thee however slight though nothing could be slight which displeases thine infinite majesty i know for certain that if the soul which truly loves should behold in herself one thing which separated her from god her spouse her body would be ground into powder this i know by means of the extreme and unspeakable torments which i suffer from the interior fire which burns within me and hence i conclude that love cannot endure even the least opposition nor will it remain with any one who does not first remove all obstacles and impediments in order to remain with it in peace and perfect quiet chapter twenty one this holy soul was so regulated by god that in all that was necessary and reasonable she satisfied every one and although she was entirely employed in serving her sweet love yet she was never willing to displease her neighbor either in word or deed but on the contrary always assisted him as far as she was able she said however to her lord thou hast commanded me to love my neighbor and i am unable to love any one but thee or to admit any partner with thee how then shall i obey thee and interiorly he responded thus he who loves me loves also all whom i love it suffices that for the welfare of the neighbor thou shouldest do all that is necessary for his soul and body such a love as this is sure to be without passion because it is not in himself but in god that the neighbor should be loved speaking afterwards on this subject she said before god created man love was pure and simple free from all taint of self-interest and needing no restraint and in creating man god was moved by no other cause except his pure love in all that he did for him he had no other motive or object and as his love allows nothing to prevent it from doing all possible good to its beloved and attends to nothing which is not necessary to that end so the love of man should return to god all that it receives from him and then having no respect to anything but love it will fear nothing because it never seeks its own advantage she said again 
not only is pure love incapable of suffering but it cannot even comprehend what suffering or pain can be nor understand the wicked actions which it sees others do and were it possible for it to feel all the pains which are felt by the devils and the damned souls it could never say that they were pains because in order to feel or comprehend pain it truly is necessary to be without this love the true and pure love is of such force that it cannot be diverted from its object nor can it see or feel anything else hence it is useless toil to try to make such creatures employ themselves in the things of this world for with regard to them they are as insensible as if they were dead it is impossible to describe this love in words or figures which will not in comparison with the reality seem entirely false this only can be understood namely that the human intellect is unable to comprehend it and to him who seeks to know what it is that i know and feel i can only reply that it transcends all utterance chapter twenty two the vocation and the correspondence of this holy soul were like those of the glorious apostle st paul that is that in one instant as was narrated in the beginning she was made perfect and this was evident because in that instant and ever thereafter she proceeded not like a beginner but like one already perfect for this reason she never knew how to give any account of the way to obtain perfection because she herself had never attained it by acquired virtues but simply by infused grace which instantaneously wrought in her such effects as usually require the uninterrupted exercises of a whole life and being thus transformed in god the fire of love which burned in her purified heart was as great at the beginning as it was at the end of her conversion which was a miraculous thing she said that after she was called and wounded with love she never experienced any suffering either interior or exterior either from the world the devil or the flesh or from any other cause this was the effect of her interior transformation in god so that although many adversities befell her nevertheless she never found her will opposed to them but on the contrary she received all things as from god and thus mingled with his love nothing failed to please her her humanity too was so subjected to the spirit that it never rebelled although it was obliged to perform many penances so that in her was fulfilled the saying my heart and my flesh have rejoiced in the living god psalm eighty three and therefore she said when i see the greatness of the spiritual operation and behold how important is any offence against god or his grace i find it impossible to conceive of any other suffering or any other hell than to have sinned against him all other pains which it is possible to endure in this life are consolations in comparison with this just as on the other hand all things inferior to god which may seem to have a sort of goodness are yet in comparison with him only evil this however i know well will hardly be understood by him who does not know it by experience on the other hand i know not how man can be so blind as not to see that unless god sustains us by his grace we are full of sorrow bitterness wrath discontent and woe even in this present life where however we are never entirely abandoned by him no matter how great our sins may be for if a man could possibly live this mortal life when entirely forsaken by god accepting only the divine justice failing which he would be annihilated i am certain that whoever beheld such a being would die and not only he who beheld him but he who though far removed from him should learn of his existence and comprehend the misery of his state would also be deprived of life to be abandoned by god is a thing too terrible and vast for human words to express or human intellects to comprehend alas with how many perils is man surrounded in this life when i consider of what great importance are spiritual life and death if god did not sustain me i believe i should die 
if i could have any desire it would be that of expressing all that i feel and know concerning this and if it were granted me to demonstrate what i wish by martyrdom i do not believe i could find any torments which i would not joyfully undergo if so i might warn man of the importance of this truth when i beheld that vision in which i saw the magnitude of the stain of even one least sin against god i know not why i did not die i said i no longer marvel that hell is so horrible since it was made for sin for even hell as i have seen it i do not believe to be really proportionate to the dreadfulness of sin on the contrary it seems to me that even in hell god is very merciful since i have beheld the terrible stain caused by but one venial sin and what in comparison to that would be a mortal sin and then so many mortal sins surely if any one could behold all this even if he were immortal anguish would once more make him mortal even that slight and solitary vision which i beheld and which lasted but an instant if it had continued but a little longer would have destroyed my body had it been made of adamant but all that i can say concerning it seems false beside what i truly comprehended for this vision brought me so near death that my blood congealed and my whole body was so enfeebled that i seemed to be passing beyond this life but the goodness of god desired that i should live to narrate it and afterwards i said i no longer wonder that purgatory is as terrible as hell since one is to punish and the other to cleanse both of them are made for sin which is so horrible that both its punishments and its purgation must needs correspond with it in horror man could understand this if he considered his evil inclinations and how wretched he is when left to himself but god does not permit this vision to be seen except by those who are as it were confirmed in grace and even these he allows to see only so much as will be for their own good and that of others and he shows them also that goodness which rescues man from these great and incomprehensible perils to which he is subject although he beholds them not but god knows them and their importance and therefore the great love he bears us moves him to compassion and so as long as we are in this life he never ceases to incite us to well-doing in order that we may not be more deeply plunged into evil from this may be seen how it was that the conversion of this soul was accomplished like that of saint paul who wrapped into heaven beheld the glory of the just while saint catherine beheld the pains which sinners have merited by their crimes how full of abomination they are and how earnestly to be fled from chapter twenty three this illuminated soul said that she saw a vision of self-love and beheld that its master and lord was the demon and she said that self-hate would be a better name for it because it makes man do all the evil that it wills and in the end precipitates him into hell she beheld it in man as it were by essence both spiritually and corporally and in all of these ways it seemed so entirely incorporated with him that it appeared to her almost impossible that he should be purified in this life she also said the true self-love has these properties first it cares not whether it injures either its own soul or body or those of its neighbor nor does it value the goods and reputation of either itself or others for the sake of accomplishing its ends it is as rigorous with itself as with others and will submit to no possible contradiction when it has resolved upon any action it remains unmoved by either promises or threats how great soever they may be but perseveres in its course caring neither for slavery nor poverty for infamy nor weakness for purgatory death nor hell for it is so blind that it cannot see these things or recognize their importance if one should say to man that if he would abandon his self-love he would acquire riches gain health possess in this world all that heart could desire and be certain of heaven hereafter he would yet repeal them all because his heart is unable to value any good either temporal or eternal which does not bear the impress of self-love everything else he despises and counts for nothing 
while to this he becomes a slave going wherever it wills and so submissive that he has no other choice he neither speaks thinks nor understands aught else if he is called mad and foolish he cares nothing for it nor is he offended by the derision or others he has shut his eyes and closed his ears to all else and beholds them as if they were not she said moreover self-love is so subtle a robber that it commits its thefts even upon god himself without fear or shame employing his goods as if they were its own and assigning as a reason that it cannot live without them and this robbery is hidden under so many veils of apparent good that it can hardly be detected except by the penetrating light of true love which always desires to remain uncovered and bare both in heaven and earth because it has nothing shameful to conceal and therefore self-love never understands the nature of pure love for pure love sees not how the things which it knows as they are in truth could possibly be possessed or appropriated nothing would displease it so much as to find anything which it could call its own the reason of this is that pure love sees not nor can it ever see anything but truth itself which being by its nature communicable to all can never be monopolized by any self-love on the other hand is in itself an obstacle to truth and neither believes it nor beholds it but rather confiding in itself holds truth as an enemy and an alien but the spiritual self-love is much more perilous than the corporal for it is bitter poison whose anecdote is hard to find it is yet more artfully veiled and passes sometimes as sanctity or necessity or again as charity or pity hiding itself behind almost infinite disguises the sight of which causes my heart almost to faint within me behold also what blindness self-love occasions between god and man and know that no evil can be so great as this yet man does not perceive it but seems to hold it as salutary and to rejoice over what ought rather to make him weep there is no doubt that if man could perceive the many difficulties thrown by self-love in the way of his own good he would no longer allow himself to be deceived by it and its malignity is the more to be dreaded because it is so powerful that were but one grain of it in the world would be sufficient to corrupt all mankind wherefore i conclude that self-love is the root of all evils which exist in the world and in the other behold lucifer whose present state is the result of following the suggestions of his self-love and in ourselves it seems to me even worse our father adam has so contaminated us that to my eyes the evil appears almost incurable for it so penetrates our veins our nerves our bones that we can neither say nor think nor do anything which is not full of the poison of this love not even those thoughts and deeds which are directed toward the purification of the spirit for so great and hopeless an infirmity no remedy can be found but god and if he does not heal us in this world by his grace our defects must needs be cleansed hereafter by the fire of purgatory it being necessary before it is possible for us to behold the pure face of god that we should be freed from all our stains and therefore when i see how rigorous and severe is this purgation and that it is not in man's power to escape from self-love or to see and understand the dangers of its hidden venom as it is necessary that he should i long to cry out in a voice that should even pierce the heavens god help me god help me and continue this cry so long as life remains to me consider then that if this love is of such force that it makes man regardless of life or death heaven or hell how incomparably greater must that divine love be which god himself infuses by his great goodness into our hearts this love unlike the other has an eye not only to the welfare of our souls and bodies but to those of our neighbor and is careful to preserve his honor and his goods it is benignant and gentle in all things and to all men it renounces its self-will and accepts instead the will of god to whom it always submits god moreover by his incomparable love so inflames purifies 
illuminates and fortifies its will that it no longer fears anything but sin because that alone displeases god and therefore rather than commit the least sin it would choose to undergo the most atrocious torments that can be imagined this is one of the effects of the divine love which gives man such liberty peace and contentment that he seems almost to enjoy heaven while yet in this life and is so absorbed that he can neither speak nor think nor desire aught beside this divine love which thus separates us from the world and from ourselves in order to unite us to god is our only true and proper love when therefore it has been thus infused into our hearts what more can we desire in this world or in the other death becomes a thing longed after and hell loses its terrors for the soul which loves for it dreads nothing but sin which alone can separate it from its beloved oh if men and especially those who love could only know how great and heavy a thing it is to offend god they would know it to be the greatest hell that could be suffered he who has once enjoyed this sweet and gentle love and lost it through any fault of his would suffer agonies like those of the condemned souls and esteem no toils too great by which he might once again regain it long experience has taught me that the love of god is our life our bliss and our repose and that self-love is continual weariness misery and death both in this world and in the other chapter twenty four this holy soul said i see three ways which god takes when he wishes to purify the creature the first is when he gives it a love so stripped of all things that even if it desired it could neither see nor wish for anything but this love which by reason of its poverty and simplicity is able to detect every vestige of self-love and seeing the truth it can never be self-deceived but is reduced to such despair of itself that it is unable to say or do anything which could afford it either corporal or spiritual consolation and thus by degrees its self-love is destroyed since it is certain that he who eats not dies notwithstanding this however so great is the evil of self-love that it clings to man almost to the end of his life i have seen this in myself for from time to time i have found many natural desires destroyed within me which had previously seemed to me very good and perfect but when they were thus removed i saw that they had been depraved and faulty and in accordance with those spiritual and bodily infirmities which being hidden from me i had not supposed myself to possess and this is why it is necessary to attain such a subtlety of spiritual vision in order that all which at first appears to us perfection may in the end be known as imperfections robberies and woes all this is clearly revealed in that mirror of truth pure love in which all things appear distorted which to us had seemed upright the second mode which i beheld and which pleased me more than the first is that in which god gives man a mind occupied with great suffering for that makes him know himself and how abject and vile he is this vision of his own misery keeps him in great poverty and deprives him of all things which could afford him any savour of good thus his self-love is not able to nourish itself and from lack of nourishment it wastes away until at last man understands that if god did not hold his hand giving him his being and remove from him this hateful vision he could never issue from this hell and when god is pleased to take away this vision of his utter hopelessness in himself afterwards he remains in great peace and consolation the third mode which is still more excellent than either of these is when god gives his creature a mind so occupied in him that neither interiorly nor exteriorly is it able to think of anything but god and those things which are his even the works which it performs it does not think of or hold in any esteem except in so far as they are necessary to the love of god and hence it seems like one dead to the world for it is unable to delight itself in anything or to understand anything even if it wished to do so either in heaven or on earth 
there is given to it also such a poverty of spirit that it knows neither what it has nor what it does nor does it make any provision for what it should do either with regard to god or to the world for itself or for its neighbor because it is not shown how it may do so but is always held by god in union with him and in sweet confusion in this way the soul remains rich yet poor unable to appropriate anything or to nourish itself because it is necessary that it should be lost and annihilated in itself and thus find itself in god in whom in truth it was from the beginning although it knew not how it was so there is also the religious life of which i will say nothing further because all must pass through one of these three ways of which i have been speaking and also because it has been sufficiently treated by others chapter twenty five the perfection of this saint thus illuminated by god the true light could not be understood for it did not manifest itself by outward acts but all her perfection was in the interior of her soul in the view of herself and of her god with whom she was united in an extraordinary manner and also in secret interior conversations some of which she repeated twice although she could poorly utter them in words not as they actually took place within for they were unutterable and she could only express them by solemnitudes the state of this soul was not passive as it is wont to be with others for so profound was her sense of the importance of what she saw that it inflamed her heart to such a degree that she felt dangerously ill it is easy to perceive from this how far such a creature was removed from the common experience usually men hardly feel any compunction for the sins they have committed and of venial offences they scarcely make any account but the body of the saint was almost rent in pieces when it was given her to see the greatness of even a venial sin and if god had discovered to her one of these sins in herself she certainly would have fallen dead her sufferings were often so great that recourse was had to medical treatment and letting of blood was ordered to relieve the burning fire of the spirit and restore the power of speech but with little effect medicines were also administered when she seemed near her end but they increased her suffering although she took them in obedience it then began to be understood that god was the author of these things and she was left to struggle with her attacks without medicine but it required great care and watchfulness to preserve her life the devoted attendants who surrounded her were confounded and she sometimes said in a voice scarcely audible now my heart seems as if in ashes i am consuming with love at other times to relieve her humanity she would go into a solitary apartment and there cast herself upon the ground crying o oh, love i can bear no more and writhing in agony the house would resound with her cries and lamentations sometimes when walking in the garden she would address the plants and trees saying are you not creatures created by my god are you not obedient to him and thus discoursing she would obtain some relief for her sufferings but if she perceived she was overheard she suddenly stopped and answered any one who spoke to her according to the necessities of the affairs of human life chapter twenty six this soul had so close a union with god and her free will was brought into such subjection that she felt no resistance nor choice having conquered all things more than humanity can comprehend yet she said there were three things too two of which she could not consent and a third which she could not but desire in the first place she could not consent to nor commit any even the smallest sin for having the greatest horror of sin and having attained through the sight of her own misery to the greatest simplicity she did not perceive it in others and could not comprehend how men could consent to it particularly to mortal sin and if perchance she saw with her own eyes some inexcusable sin still she could not understand that there could be in man the malice of sin believing that others honored god as she honored him secondly and this although obscure to the imperfect intellect was clear to her she could not unite with the will of god in suffering so cruel a passion 
and she would rather have endured all the pains of all the souls in hell than that her love should suffer such punishment the third thing and it was this that she could not refrain from desiring was holy communion for holy communion is nothing but god himself and in this she testified the great reverence and honor in which she held priests namely by affirming that if the priest had not been willing to give her communion she would have taken it patiently and not persisted but wishing to receive communion she could not say that she did not wish it chapter twenty seven all things took place in this holy soul in the order of true love and she sometimes said to her lord o oh, love if others are bound to keep thy commandments i am bound to keep them by a tenfold obligation because they are sweet and full of love thou dost not command things that lead to evil but to him who obeys thou givest great peace love and union with thyself this cannot be understood by one who has not experienced it for the divine precepts although they are contrary to sensuality are yet in accordance with the spirit which by its nature seeks separation from all the bodily senses by union with god to which union i find every other love of things inferior to god to be a hindrance she saw that all things are necessary which god ordains who is only waiting to consume interiorly and exteriorly all our corrupt affections and that all wrongs injuries contempt sickness poverty abandonment of relatives and friends the temptations of the devil mortifications and all else contrary to humanity are especially needful to us that we may combat with them till at length gaining through them the victory our corrupt affections may be extinguished until adversity appears to us no longer bitter but sweet whoever believes that anything good or bad can befall him which can separate him from god shows that he is not yet strong in divine charity for man should fear nothing but to offend god and all beside should be to him as if it were not for herself she said that she seemed to see in her heart a ray of love proceeding from god binding them together with a golden thread and had no fear that it would ever be loosed and this had been the case ever since her conversion her sweet lord gave her such confidence that when she was moved to pray for anything something within seemed to say command for love can do it indeed she had everything she asked with all possible certainty she was wont to say the love of god is our proper love for we are created for that alone the love on the contrary for everything beside ought in truth to be termed hatred since it deprives us of our proper love which is god love then god who loves thee and leave him who does not love thee namely everything beneath god for all things are enemies to that true love oh that i could make this truth be felt as i feel it i am certain that there is no creature who would not love him so that if the sea were the food of love there are no men or women who would not drown themselves in it and those who are at a distance from it would always be drawing nearer to it that they might plunge into it for every pleasure when compared to it is pain and such riches does it confer on a man that all besides should seem to him but misery it makes him so light that he does not feel the earth beneath his feet his affections are so fixed on things above that he loses all sense of suffering here below and he is so free that there is nothing to keep him from the presence of god if you asked me what dost thou feel i should answer thee what i could not see nor ear hear but i am ashamed to speak of it in my poor language for i am certain that all i can say of god is not of god but only fragments that fall from his table chapter twenty eight take a loaf said the saint and eat it and after you have eaten it its substance goes to the nutriment of the body and what is superfluous passes away for if nature retained it having no need of it the body would die now if that bread should say to the body why do you deprive me of my existence for by my nature i am not satisfied to be thus reduced to nothingness if i could i would defend myself from thee for it is natural for every creature to preserve itself the body would answer 
bread thy being is designed for my support which is more worthy than thee and hence thou shouldest be more content with the end for which thou wast created than with thy own being for if it were not for thy end thy being would have no value but to be thrown aside as something worthless and dead it is thy end which gives thee a dignity to which thou canst not attain but by means of thy annihilation if thou wouldst live for thy end thou wouldst care for thy being but wouldst say quickly quickly take me from myself and let me attain my end for which i am created this soul became so detached both exteriorly and interiorly that she could no longer perform her accustomed exercises for she had lost all vigor of mind and body she had no desire to confess but going to confession as usual she found that she had no part in any sin and when she attempted to mention her offences generally it seemed to her that she was deceiving and through her entire detachment she was in possession of the greatest peace of which she was never divested chapter twenty nine of free will this blessed one said that when she considered carefully her vocation she saw such great things effected by god in her that it almost seemed as if she had been forced by him for she could see nowhere her own consent but rather it seemed to her that she had resisted especially in the beginning and the sense of this had inflamed her with a burning love but generally when speaking of it she said god first rouses man from sin then with the light of faith illuminates the intellect and afterwards with a certain satisfaction and zeal inflames the will and almighty god does this in an instant although we tell it in many words and measure it by time when the saint was sometimes urged by her spiritual children to give them an idea of her state in words she would tell them it was impossible but on one occasion she allowed a religious to interpret it in order to gratify his desire to understand it better which he did to her great satisfaction and joy wherefore with a benignant countenance she exclaimed oh my dear child it is as you have said and hearing you i feel it is thus you have said all that can be said but the effect is incomprehensible then the religious said to her o oh mother cannot you ask of god your love some little drops of it for your children and she answered joyfully i see this sweet love so gracious to his children that i can ask nothing for them but that i may present them in his presence this creature became at length like a cherub to look upon so that she gave great consolation to every one who beheld her and those who visited her found it hard to leave her when she was about sixty-three years of age her heart was inflamed anew with a ray of love this dart was so powerful and penetrating that she felt as if severely wounded in the region of the heart and she suffered great bodily pain after some days she was again inflamed with love and it always seemed to her that the last wound was the greatest chapter thirty in the year fifteen o seven while present at the office for the dead she felt a desire to die it was a desire of the soul that it might quit the body and be united with god the body also desired it that it might be freed from the torment which it suffered from the flames of love in the soul these however were only natural desires to which her will gave no consent and as her desire was inspired by her love who wished to purify her and not from her will as soon as she felt it she suddenly exclaimed o oh, love i desire nothing but thee and in thy own way but if it please thee who dost not wish that i should die neither that i should desire death let me at least be present at the death and burial of others that i may see in them that blessedness that is not bestowed on me love consented to this and for some time she was present at the death and burial of all those who died in the hospital without any desire to die herself and by degrees the union of love increasing in that purified heart she lost the desire to see others die but still whenever she spoke of death she seemed filled with a new and joyful emotion at one time when she fell into ecstasies and appeared as if dead the persons around her who did not understand her state believed her to be suffering from what is commonly called vertigo she herself 
through humility and a desire to be unnoticed on speaking of it to a religious also called it vertigo but the religious answered mother you need not use concealment with me i entreat you for the honor and glory of god to choose some person who will be satisfactory to you and narrate to him the graces with which god has favored you that when you are gone these graces may not remain hidden and unknown and the praise and glory of god arising from them be lost to which she answered it shall be as you wish if it is the will of my sweet love and she would choose no other than himself who had given her this counsel although she knew it would be impossible for her to narrate the smallest part of those interior communications between god and the soul and of the exterior she had experienced almost nothing at another time in conversation with the same religious she began to narrate her conversion and many other things as well as she could which had been faithfully collected and introduced into the present volume chapter thirty one when love had taken upon himself the care and control of everything he never more abandoned it and i said the saint gave the keys of the house to love with full power to do all that was necessary and i took no heed of body or soul friends relatives or the world but of all that the law of pure love requires i took care that the least part should not be wanting and when i saw love accepting the charge and producing the effect i turned towards him and was occupied in watching this his work and he made me look upon many things as unjust and imperfect which before had appeared to myself and others as just and perfect and in everything was found defects if i spoke of spiritual things love suddenly checked me telling me that i must not speak but let the flame burn on within no word and no act escaping which should serve to refresh either soul or body one day i asked my confessor if i should try to eat that i might not cause any injury to the soul or body love answered me within and the confessor from without who is this who speaks of eating or not eating under the form of a motive be silent for i know you and you cannot deceive me finding his eyes so acute and powerful i gave up all to him asking god to do with me what seemed to him good to strip me of all things and clothe me with his simple pure powerful great and burning love and then love exclaimed it is my will to leave every one naked naked neither will i have anything above me nor under me and be it known to you that such is my nature and condition that i convert and change into myself all souls that can be changed despoiling them of self love will be alone if another should be in his company the gates of heaven would be closed against him for they are open only to pure love let each one then leave himself to be guided by love that he may be conducted to that end which pure love desires all to attain pure love draws the soul to himself in a variety of ways and when he sees her occupied with any affection he marks all things that she loves as his enemies and consumes them without sparing herself or her body and although the nature of love would destroy them by one blow yet seeing the weakness of man he cuts away little by little and silently for we cling so firmly to the object of our love which we esteem beautiful good and just that we will listen to nothing that opposes us therefore love says i will put my hand to the work for with words i can do nothing i will destroy all things that thou lovest by death infirmity or poverty by hatred and discord by detraction scandal lies and infamy by relatives by friends and by thyself till thou knowest not what to do finding thyself cast out from all things that constituted thy delight and receiving from them only pain and confusion neither dost thou understand these operations of divine love all of which seem contrary to reason both as regards god and the world therefore thou dost cry and lament striving and hoping to escape from this distress and thou wilt never escape from it when divine love has kept a soul thus in suspense and as it were desperate 
and disgusted with all things that before she loved. Then he shows her himself, with his divinely joyful and radiant countenance, and as soon as the soul perceives it, naked and destitute, she casts herself into his hands, crying, O oh, blind one, what dost thou seek? What hast thou desired? Here are all the delights thou hast sought. O oh, divine love, how sweetly hast thou deceived me, in order to strip me of all self-love, and clothe me with pure love, abounding with every delight. Now that I see the truth, I have nothing to lament but my ignorance. Chapter 32 With this blessed soul everything was so well ordered, that whenever she had control, or could offer a remedy, she never could endure any disorder, and she could neither live nor converse with persons who were not well regulated, especially if they were those who appeared to have entered with herself the way of perfection. And when she saw them countenancing any imperfection, and taking part in any of those things which she had learned to abhor, she left their company. She was very compassionate to all creatures, although merciless to their defects, so that when an animal was killed, or a tree cut down, she could hardly bear to see them lose the life that God had given them. But she would have been very severe in rooting out the evil from one who had brought it upon himself by sin. She could not see her own sins, or realize that she must sometimes commit them, neither could she believe that others would sin, and so entire was the peace of her mind, that it seemed to substitute for bodily sleep. Such repose was, however, more refreshing to her body than natural sleep, for sleep takes off the mind from God. She was so restrained interiorly, that she was wont to say, if I uttered a word, breathed a sigh, or cast a glance toward any person who could understand me, my humanity would be well content, as a thirsty person when given drink. Meaning by this, that when she was pierced by the arrows of divine love, she lost all feeling and remained motionless, until God, as it often happened, relieved her from this occupation. So opposite and repugnant was the spirit to humanity, that when humanity wept, the spirit laughed, and held her in such subjection as to reprove her, not only for every unnecessary action, but for every word, not permitting those around to offer her any alleviation in her trials, seeming ever lovingly to mock her by exciting her desires for these things with which she was accustomed to console herself, allowing her to taste all things, and then suddenly destroying all relish for them, till by degrees she had none left for any earthly thing, and could find no exterior or interior nourishment, and in this desolation a secret longing would come over her to hide herself and weep and lament. Sometimes she would cast herself into the hedge of rose trees in the garden, and seize the thorns with both hands, without feeling the pain, so entire was the occupation of her mind. She would bite and burn her hands, to relieve the interior suffering that consumed her, and the most extreme external pain she esteemed as nothing. Her body was often so deserted by the spirit, that without any resistance on her part, four persons could not move her from her seat. All these things were not done voluntarily, but by a spontaneous impulse. Neither did she find any consolation upon the earth but was constrained to shun those things without which others cannot live. She found no solace except in her confessor, with whom she had an interior and exterior correspondence. But he too was taken from her, and her sufferings greatly increased, because there was nothing to which she could have recourse, either in heaven or on earth, and she was wont to say, I am in this world like one who is away from home, who has left all his relatives and friends, and finds himself in a foreign land, when having accomplished the business for which he was sent, he is ready to leave and go home, where his heart and mind are. For so ardent is his love of his own country, that a day of absence seems a year. She felt herself every day more and more restrained, like one who is confined at first within the walls of a city, then in a house without a garden, now in a hall, now in a chamber, then again in an antechamber, sometimes in a dimly lighted, remote apartment, then in a dark prison, her hands tied, 
her feet chained, her eyes bandaged, and without food. For no one could speak with her, and she was left without hope of release but by death. She had no consolation but the knowledge that it is a merciful God who does all this in his love, and with this she was satisfied. On one occasion, hearing someone repeat the words, Arise, arise, ye dead, and come to judgment, she cried aloud, in the excess of love, would that i come now now and all who heard her were astonished with that burning love in her heart it seemed to her that she could pass through the most searching judgment for she saw nothing in herself for that judgment to condemn she even took pleasure in the thought of it for she earnestly desired to see the infinitely powerful and just judge who makes all things tremble except pure and simple love 